Okay. Uh, thank you. So uh, let me first thank the organizer of this school uh, for the very kind invitation to be here in this beautiful and, and a very nice place. Um, so I'm going to tell you about some... Um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, to tell you in, in three different um, um, seminars about uh, high-dimensional inference and uh, phase transitions. I mean, high-dimensional inference from the point of view of a statistical physicist. And uh, so the first two lectures will be more theoretical and the last one will be more about applications to um, biological data modeling and you'll see two kinds of application I will, I will show you. Okay, so I'm assuming by default that um, nobody, I mean, at least some people don't, don't know about the Bayesian inference. So I don't know if I will be too slow at the beginning, but my assumption was that there might be some students who actually never heard about Bayesian inference. So I will start with very basic examples and then go to, to more sophisticated uh, subjects. Okay, so what is Bayesian inference in a few slides? Um, we uh, have some data, um, let's say observation, experimental observation, for instance, which I will call sigma in the following. And what we would like to do is actually exploit or extract information for, uh, from these observations. And there are many different uh, objectives that one can pursue in this, uh, in this setting. One is actually to understand how the data were generated. So what is the what are the underlying mechanisms which were uh, at the source, at the origin of the data. And that can be seen, for instance, if we look for a model, a model with some parameters, tau, here. And we like to adjust the parameters in order that the model is actually producing some data which look like the observation. That may be very useful if you want to understand actually how, wh where the data come from. But another thing we will want to be uh, interested, we can be interested in is actually try to predict uh, new data, do prediction for future, suppose your data are some uh, temporal sequence, for instance, you would like to be able to predict what is going to happen in future. Or you would like to be able to reconstruct some part of the data which were missing in the experiment. So the objectives are multiple, and I, and I would like to show you just three examples which are actually related to what I'm going to tell you on the last lecture on Thursday. So one example, uh, one example, sorry, is uh, the analysis of a concerted activity for new R population. So here I'm going, uh, I'm, I'm just showing some picture which were extracted from some papers by uh, Markus Meiter and uh, Herut Shenman and collaborators. Um, so here you have a retina. So suppose you, um, you consider the retina, uh, usually people do experiments in, with the retina of salamander, for instance, which is nice to work with. So the retina of the animal can be extracted from the eye, put on a glass surface, on one side, you will um, show some, some stimuli. So for instance, some uh, stimuli which are, which are uh, put display here on the computer screen. And on the other side of the glass surface are uh, put some electrodes which are able to collect the electrical activity of the population of, of ganglion cells. So the retina is made of, is, uh, made of different layers. The first layer cons uh, consists of photo, uh, uh, photoreceptors which are able to transmit the uh, visual information, let's say the uh, photons into electrical signals uh, up to the last layer where the axons, let's say the outputs of the last layer of the ganglion cells go to the visual cortex. So basically what you record here is the activity of this last layer and you see you get some spikes, some uh, activities at, at different times of the different neurons and the question is how can we understand the connection or let's say the relationship between what is presented on the computer screen, on the screen of a computer and the activity of this population. So if I want to schematize this, I have a set of inputs, which are visual inputs here. The retina is performing some kind of encoding into uh, the activity of a ganglion cell, ganglion cell uh, sets here. And I measure the output here. I would like to understand how this encoding is done. And maybe I would like also to understand how to do some decoding. So how from the uh, activity of this population here, I can actually reconstruct some information about the image. <clears throat> so these are the observation. Here we have some model with some parameters, and we would like to understand how the retina is wired in order to realize uh, the observation we have input-output pairs, or we like to, to predict some things about the input if we observe only the output. So this is the kind of question we may be interested in. Another example, which is some kind of historical examples at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, is population ecology, interaction between species. So you may observe, for instance, uh, or measure the populations of different animals. Here it's a very simple examples of, of, of a prey, rabbits, and a predator, uh, fox. 
And um, this may be, so the population is actually changing, the populations are changing over time, and you have to understand how you can reconstruct the interaction between the species from the observation of these populations. So a very basic <coughs> model for that is called the lotka Volterra model for in ecology. And essentially what we say, if you divide by ni, which is the number of individuals in population i, is that the derivative of a log of ni over t, which is the growth rate of a population, is going to be something which is uh, some, some growth rate in the absence of any, I mean, let's say for instance, at very low level of populations. And then the growth rate ri will be diminished or will be increased depending on the interaction with the, the species itself. So you may have some carrying capacity, which is the maximum size the species can reach. But also, for instance, if you have a prey or predator, then the coefficients here may be positive or negative depending on, on the status of the, of the organism. So the question is, <clears throat> is, we assume this is a good model to understand this oscillation of population, these changes over time. Can we guess, can we infer the coefficients here uh, in this equation, so can we understand the model parameters tau I was mentioning in the first slide, and can we uh, actually predict what is going to happen in future? So this is something of practical importance when people want to compute, for instance, the probability that a species will get extinct over some years, over some decades, and they have models which are very similar to that, plus some, some noise, for instance, some logistic growth, I mean, some, some noise here. And, and there are many questions you can ask whether, for instance, if you if this kind of model is good, you can ask whether actually you have some additive for additivity. So for instance, if you measure uh, three different, pop and you have three different population and you measure the interaction two by two, then it, you can predict, the, you can measure the coefficients, but now you can put the three species together or together in interaction, you will have to see whether the model you obtain is still good. Or do you have three body interaction, this kind of question. And the last example I will show is something I will develop more in, on, on Thursday is a uh, co-evolution of residues in protein families. So um, if you think of, of proteins, which um, have a very essential uh, function for, for organisms, like for instance, cutting DNA, copying DNA, repairing, editing, and so on, these proteins are present in all living organisms, from bacteria to, to, to mammals. And of course, they all originate, I mean, um, hypothetically from a last common ancestor billions of years ago. And what happened is that the same function and essentially the same structure in 3D space have been conserved over time, but the sequences which realize these proteins have largely diverged. So now what we can do, since sequencing is very cheap and very efficient, you can collect the sequences of all these proteins across many, many organisms and compare them. And this is typically what you get. Here you see each line will be one particular organism, and each column will be one particular site on the protein. So you can compare all the proteins, which are just the primary sequences. And this is an alignment which comes from the, uh, for one particular protein domain, which is called PDZ, which is a very important protein domain because it allows bigger protein to bind specifically to other proteins. So it's a binding unit. So uh, if you compare all these sequences, you will see that on some position, I don't know if you can see anything, actually. The quality is not very good, quality of sight. But you will see that on some positions, um, you get always the same amino acid, or so they are highly conserved. And most of the time, in these highly conserved positions are in the bulk of a protein, in the core of a protein, where mutations are very hard, they would likely disrupt the structural protein, or they are on the surface on very specific spots, which specifically interact with other uh, proteins or with other peptides, okay? So changing the amino acids there would change the, the specificity of the interaction, so they are highly concerned. But on other uh, side, you see that there are a lot of possible mutations. So uh, the question is whether actually anything can be put here, do we have only neutral side, or are there sub subtle correlation between the different sites? And in fact, um, a long time ago, let's say about 25 years ago, it was um, uh, hypothesized that um, correlation between different sites, which may be far away along the primary sequence, may be due to proximity in 3D space on the structure. Once the protein falls into itself, sites which are far away along the sequence may be closed in space. And you can imagine, for instance, if you do a mutation on one site, then you have to compensate by another mutation on the other site which is closed in space in order to maintain the 3D structure. For instance, if one amino acid is positively charged, 
if you mutate and the other one is, minor, is, uh, is negatively charged and they, they make a contact, if you change the plus charge into a minus, then you have to compensate in the other charge. Otherwise, that would disrupt your structure. Okay, so here the question is how can we, from uh, the observation, which are just a bunch of sequences, say something about the three-dimensional structure of a protein? Okay, so let's say sigma would be this ob observation here, and tau would be the three-dimensional structure, or maybe also some functional information about the protein. I will come back to that one first. Okay, so these are all very diverse examples uh, to motivate what I'm going to do, and. Um, to come back to what Bayesian inference is, Bayesian inference actually can be summarized uh, very briefly in a couple of lines, and here it is. The fundamental idea, yes? Yes? It, it's basically scaling with the number of, uh, yes, with the lengths. Everything is going to be constant. Yeah, okay, so um, of course you may have contacts which are, let's say, a little bit, um, which are in, in the secondary structure. So for instance, you can have contacts in, in alpha helices, in beta strands, things like that. These are, let's say, the easy contacts. What we are interested in here are long-range contacts, in the sense that they are, they, they, you don't see them in the secondary structure. They really take place in the 3D uh, fold. And there are not so many of them. But I will give you examples on further. You will see on different things. OK. So the basic idea, so for, for those of you who have never heard about uh, Bayesian inference, is the following. So we assume or we consider that both the observations and the parameters of the model are stochastic variables. And the core quantity we look at is the joint distribution of sigma and tau. So we will see precise examples later on. So here I'm very uh, schematic. So there, there is an object which is a joint distribution of sigma and tau, which I call P of sigma comma tau. And of course, uh, I can write this object in two different ways. I can first introduce the marginal distribution over tau, Okay. and then write the conditional distribution of, of sigma given tau. And I will write that the joint distribution is a product of the marginal distribution of tau times the conditional probability of sigma uh, given tau. Or I can do the opposite. It's just a formal manipulation so far. I can introduce the marginal distribution sigma and then the conditional probability of tau given sigma. Okay? And both products should be equal. So let me just do this very simple manipulation, then we, we try to understand what that means. So for instance, if I am interested, so what, what or, or, or let's say, so what, what am I doing here? Sigma are the observations. This is what I collect from the, my experiment. So I have them. Tau are the, define the underlying parameters of a model, okay? That I would like to guess, uh, to infer from the data. So what I would like to do is actually to have the conditional distribution of tau um, given sigma, this is what I'm interested in for inference, okay? So I will extract this quantity from the equality here, and this is in this formula here, which is called Bayes' inference formula. So, it's, so let me say it again. Uh, the conditional distribution of the parameters of the model, given sigma, is equal to the ratio of two quantities. On the numerator, I have two terms. One is P of tau, which is called the prior distribution over the model parameters. This is what I know about the model I'm looking, for, I'm looking for without actually looking at any data. So for instance, tau, you will see some examples, but tau can be a positive number. That's something I know. It can be smaller than 0.5. It can be, okay, all the information I have without actually looking at, at the data, I put them here, okay? Or maybe I know that tau shouldn't be too large, or maybe I will assume some Gaussian distribution or something which prevents tau from growing too, too far away from zero. Now, on the numerator, I have also P of sigma condition to tau. So this is actually the meaning of the model, which is here, hidden here. If I assume I know the model, I know all the parameters, then this model will define some probability distribution over the outcome of the experiment, over the observations. And this I should be able to compute, and this defines the connection between the model and the observations. And then at the denominator, 
I have a normalization, which depends only on the observation. It's just the integral of the numerator over all possible models. It tells you how likely are the data to come from one of the models in the family distributed with this distribution. Is it okay for the formula? So now I will show you some very basic examples of how to apply this formula, starting from something very, very simple, and then we'll go to increasingly hard uh, examples. So the observations have a sigma, okay? So, so here is the idea. Um, I want to extract some tau, some parameter tau of the model from the, from the observation sigma. So I want to, to compute this thing here. And maybe I want to maximize it to get the, be to get the best value of the tau. Or maybe I want to sample from that to get the posterior distribution. That's called the posterior distribution. So the posterior distribution is actually equal to, let's look at the numerator, the prior distribution, what I know about the model without any reference to observation, times this probability of the observation given the model, which is called also likelihood of the model given the, the observation. Okay? And this is normalized, of course. It has to be normalized. Okay, so this is what you know before. This is what you know from the association between the model and the observation. So this is where you have to put your, 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 your model. And once you, you know that, then you can construct the posterior. So for instance, if you want to find the best value of the model parameters, you have to maximize the numerator because the denominator does not depend on that. The denominator sigma, it depends only on the observation. So if you want to find the best tau, for instance, you don't care about that. You just maximize the numerator. So for instance, if you know nothing of the model, about the model, you can say that P of tau is some uniform prior. So you say it's a constant, which actually is not totally meaningful from a mathematical point of view because if the, model, if the parameters can go from minus infinity to plus infinity, this is not normalized. So there are some subtleties here. But let's assume it depends very weakly on tau. So then you just maximize this. You say, I have a model. If I know the model with parameters tau, it will produce some observation sigma. Now I observe the sigma. Let's maximize this over tau. It will be my best estimator for tau. Yes? Yes. Yes, something, yes. Oh, then you can, okay. So here, that's another question about uh, hypothesis testing. You may have different models, okay, completely different models, and you would like to compare which one is the best, yes? Yeah, but then in that case, you can compare the evidences here. So you have two classes of models. Here I'm saying, if you have one class of model, how do you select the best values of parameters? This is what I am interested in here. Now you can have two classes of models. <clears throat> And here you see for one class, when you do the inference, when for one class of model here, that is the probability that your data have been generated uh, from, by this class of model. So you can compare these two things for the two classes. But obviously what I'm saying is very theoretical because computing these quantities usually is extremely hard, okay? So you have to find some approximation and so on. Okay, so let me give you a very simple example. Uh, so suppose you have two boxes <coughs> with cookies. One contains... Uh, 20 plain cookies and 20 chocolate cookies, that's box A here. And the other box is the same, except you have more chocolate cookies. So you have 40 cookies, as in box A, but there are 10 plain cookies and 30 chocolate cookies. And now somebody is just picking up in one of the two boxes, but we don't know which one, one cookie, and is observing a cookie, it turns out it's a chocolate cookie. And you ask what is the probability that actually this person has taken the cookie from box A, or from box B, which is one minus the first one. So that's the question. So we have some observation here. So you see, it's a very simple problem. The observation is just um, chocolate cookie. It could have been plain cookie. So it's a binary variable. Sigma is uh, chocolate cookie. And tau is actually going to be A or B. So it's just a two bits problem. OK, and that's what we want to compute. So let me show you how to apply space in France to solve this problem. So again, I will use this, my, my basic formula here. <clears throat> so sigma is, um, is a chocolate cookie or, or plain cookie, and tau is box AOP. Okay, so what do I know, what do I know about the probability of box A or box B <clears throat> without having looked at the cookie? 
Well, I will assume something very simple. I will assume that actually the person is picking up in one in the two box with equal probabilities. So I will assume that the prior probability of a, of a tau is going to be one half. So p prior of a is equal to p prior of b is one half. Okay? Just randomly pick up one of the two boxes. Now I have a model. So the model tells me what is the probability of observing a plane or a chocolate cookie if I am in box A, and I have another model for box B. So here are my two models. Well, the models would be, I assume I pick up randomly one of these cookies, so the probability of picking a plain cookie in box A is one half, and chocolate cookie is one half. While here it would be <coughs> for a plain cookie one quarter and three quarters for a chocolate cookie. Okay? And I express this in this equation here. So probability of cookie equal plain in A, given A, is one half. Probability of cookie equal chocolate given A is one half, and, and similar things for B. Okay? So now I, I have everything I, I wanted in the numerator here. So, is it okay? So I can compute my posterior distribution over the box. Okay, so let's do the computation. I apply the base formula. So the probability of A, given the observation that we have a chocolate cookie, is going to be the probability of the, uh, the product of the likelihood here, probability of chocolate given A times the prior of A, which is one half and one third over the denominator, which I don't know. Now, same thing for B given chocolate. Use the same formula, and then I have three quarters times one half over the denominator. And of course, these two probabilities should, be, should sum to one, so that allows me to compute the denominator. If you compute it, you find five over eight. Okay, so now I can put back the denominator here, and I get two fifths for probability of A and three fifths for probability of B. Is it clear for the application? So it's a, it's a very elementary one. So it's a very simple problem because we have one bit of, in, of information and we want to uh, infer one bit also. You cannot imagine something simpler than that. Okay, so um, let me now turn to a problem which is a bit more complicated. Well, just a little bit more, but actually it's interesting for two reasons. It's interesting because it will illustrate something I want to say later on and also for historical reasons. Um, so it's a problem uh, that Laplace sir, solved at the end of the uh, 18th century. It's called the Laplace birth rate problem. So I think you have all heard about the Laplace method to estimate asymptotic, to get asymptotic equivalent of integrals. Yes? When, I don't know. We call it, okay. I'm always a little bit confused because in France we have the, um, as the British do in, in England, of course, we, when we have a famous mathematician, we always tend to put his name everywhere. So I wonder whether may, maybe in other countries it's not the same name. So, um, so when you want to estimate, for instance, you know, um, an integral, suppose you have an integral over some one, one single uh, real variable, just to make it simple. Uh, and you integrate exponential of n of fx, where f of x is some, let's say, uh, smooth enough function, and n is large, then you can estimate this by looking, you know, at exponential n of the maximum over x, which I call x star of f, and you will have some corrections with, that you can compute with, you know, for instance, the Gaussian uh, contribution and so on, okay? <clears throat> that we call Laplace method. I don't know whether the usual thing. Sorry? Yeah, sad, but saddle point is more general. Saddle point is when you do in complex plane and so on. Laplace is more. Okay, so, so actually, Laplace introduced this particular method in this particular work when he was interested in statistics. So that was, you know, invented this as a side thing in order to get to the result. So, what Laplace wanted to do at the end of the 18th century was to get, to have a proof, or by proof, I mean statistical proof, that boys and girls have different birth rates. Um, which was not totally clear at that time. It's actually not totally clear now why the birth rates are different. From a biological point of view, it's still a, pro a problem which is debated. But it's clear that they are different. So he had, uh, for data, the following numbers. He had the number of girls born in Paris from 1745 to 1770, which was two, uh, 245,945, and the number of boys, which was a little bit uh, larger. So, of course, on that you can say, okay, there are more boys than girls that make the point, right? But the question is, how confident we are that actually the birth rate of boys is larger than the one of girls? Because, you know, there are some fluctuations. So, even if the birth rates are equal, 
when you do an experiment on a finite number of samples, you will see differences. And that doesn't mean that the birth rates are different. So how confident can we be about the fact that they are different? So the model Laplace introduced is the simplest one you can think of. So let me now define my observation. Sigma, again, that's the number of female births. So this number here. Uh, N is the total number of births, that's the total number of observation. And tau, what I want to infer, is the girl birth probability, the, the birth rate, if you want. So now what I want to infer is not one bit, it's a real number. And I don't have one single observation, I have many observations. I have 500,000 of them. Okay, so you want to get a real number from 500,000 observations. So the simplest model you can think of is that all these births are totally unrelated, which is not totally true because they can, some of them will come from the same families and so on, okay? But anyway, let's forget about that. So the probability of sigma given tau, suppose I know the girl birth rate, will be among the n observation, I have sigma observation, which are girls. So I get a combination factor here, sigma uh, n choose sigma. And then each one will be, uh, so will be a positive event if you want the girl tau with probability tau and the boy with probability one minus tau. So I will have this binomial distribution. Okay, simplest model you can think of. And if you know nothing about the the, the birth rate, then the simplest thing you can assume is that actually the tau is some number between 0 and 1. So we don't know anything. So I will just assume some prior which is uniform over 0 and 1. Okay, so now again I use base. That's the only formula you have to know. And um, at the numerator, I will have this thing here, this probability of sigma given tau times the prior, which is uniform, so it's 1. And at the denominator, I will have the integral of the numerator over, over, ta over tau. And the combinations here, they, they just get, I mean, cancel because they are the same at the numerator and denominator. I get this formula. Yes? I agree, I agree. We could have a prior which is a bit more than that. Probably, I mean, it's very unlikely to be 0.01, right? So we could be a little more concentrated around one half. But actually, you will see, what, what matters when you remember in base formula, if I write the posterior distribution, so an important thing to be noted is that this is the probability of the observation given the model. So if I have a n observation, this thing is going to be typically exponential in n. Okay? So that means that what will dominate the probability as the number of observations becomes large is this term rather than this one. So actually the prior is very important if you have very few observations. Okay? Otherwise, you should not trust too much. I mean, what you, our prejudices about the outcome are not important if we have many observations. That's the point. Okay? So in fact, here the number is so large, you will see that the posterior is highly peaked even with the prior, which is very uniform. But the importance of a prior is, is very large. If we have few information, I'll come back to that later in the, in the talk. Okay, so I can plot this quantity here. Okay. And here I, I have plotted with Mathematica. So that's a posterior distribution. So you see the x interval is running from 0.47 to 0.52 because actually the distribution is extremely flat and close to zero everywhere except very close to 0.49. Okay, and if you compute the mean value of tau with the posterior distribution, you get this number, and the standard deviation is extremely small. And the fact that it is extremely slow comes from the fact that we have many observations. It's typically scaled as one of the growth of a number of observations. So now, if we want to solve Laplace problem, we have to estimate the probability that, the posterior probability that this girl's rate, uh, is, uh, the girl's birth rate is actually larger than 0 0.5. So we have to estimate the integral of this function over 0.5, from 0.5 to 1. Okay, and that's something which is very similar to this here. Essentially, we had to estimate something like that. Okay, where well, this is the log of a posterior. And this number here is going to be about 500,000, right? This is a total number of births. And this is why Laplace needed this, this thing here, except that it was not and at the point, it was at the boundary, okay? The, 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 um, this is dominated by what is going on in one half. And if you do the computation, that is close to 10 to the minus 42. That means the probability that actually the, 
um, girls have a birth rate which is larger than boys um, is, is extremely small, which makes the proof, right? the statistical proof. Is it okay for the second example? Yes, but is, here you see you have so many examples that you wouldn't change. Unless your choice of a prior is so bad, that, right, for instance, you would rule out the fact that it could be around 0.49. You say, oh, I know that my prior should be around between 0.7 and 0.8, some crazy prior, then, then it's, it's really bad. So we have to be a little, a little bit careful. The prior can be concentrated, but it should not rule out all the hypotheses, otherwise it's bad. So, I mean, a lot of things, I mean, you can put a lot of criticisms against that, okay? The model is very simple, okay? But, I mean, I just wanted to show you what was done. And, and I think it's interesting. So, here we have done one step. In the chocolate cookie problem, we had one bit of observation and we had one bit to infer. Here we have many more observations and we have to infer a real number. So, it's not... Actually, if we want to infer whether this real number is larger than 0.5 or not, that's also one bit. And this was the original problem. So, we had also one bit to infer, but with a huge number of observations. And we could have a large confidence about this number. Why, in the chocolate cookie problem, we had, uh, if I remember correctly, two fifths and three fifths of probabilities, you know. Also, uh, hypotheses are possible, box A or box B. Oh, for the next observation. Yes, that you can do, okay? Of course, of course. Yes, you can do. Okay, so let me... Uh, Okay, so, <clears throat> so again, uh, just to summarize what we have done, imagine you are in a plane, which is a two-dimensional uh, space, where on the x-axis I will plot the quality of the data here, which is the accuracy, how reliable they are, the number of the data, anything which, when you are here, means that you don't have, you have poor data, and when you are here, you have very good data. For instance, that number is obviously the first quantity of interest. And on the y-axis, I will plot the complexity of the model, the number of parameters in the model. Which obviously, we have to be a little bit careful. We can have a model where many, many parameters and many are just irrelevant. So everything is ill-defined in this plane. But I don't care, okay? But you can imagine, okay? You have complex models over there, and you have, you know, good data over there. So the, the, the cookie problem was there. We didn't have very good data. We had just one observation, but the model was very simple. So Laplace problem is somewhere here. The model was very simple because we had also, uh, you know, one number to guess, but we had many observations. Yes. Yes. If if your model is very simple, that means if you have essentially one single parameter or a small number of parameters compared to n, that is true. But if your model is very complex and you have many many parameters, then it's you know, it's not obvious at all. If your number of parameters is close to the number of data, this is the point I want to make here. But I agree with you. So. Okay, so here, and so here Laplace was very nice. This problem was very nice because actually we had a simple problem, in a sense a simple model, and we had many observations. So you could estimate the value of this, of this parameter with very high accuracy, and that's good. But you can imagine situations which are very bad, uh, which are much bigger. So for instance, if we are in a situation where um, we have a model we would like to understand from the data, which have many, many, many parameters, and we have very few observations, then very likely we won't be able to do anything. Or what we will infer is so, is so wide in terms of possibilities that it's just meaningless. So the question we are interested in here is what happens when we are somewhere here? Okay? So suppose we are here, then you can imagine that uh, if we have sufficiently large number of data compared to the complexity of the model, then maybe it's going to be possible and we'll be able to infer something meaningful. But there might be a line here where if we cross that line, then we are in this bad region. So the question is, is there a line here? Okay. In the line which separates what is possible, is we can do nice inference, some accurate inference, from just here we don't have enough data to infer anything meaningful. And I would like to show you some example in the following uh, time here this morning, where actually this line exists and, and can be understood. Okay. So high dimensional inference, which is the title of a lecture, is exactly that. What happens when we are in the region where 
we have a lot, lot of data, but also a lot of parameters to infer. So, that is, so that's called high D inference. So this is different from asymptotic inference, which is a classical setting where you have a, a model which is under control, so not so many parameters, and then you get more and more data, so the accuracy becomes better and better, which is going along this axis. Okay, okay so let me uh, give you an example where, of high-dimensional inference, uh, which I, was, uh, I am particularly interested in, and which is interesting for many people, um, which is the, um, the inference of interaction networks. So now we'll have a model, so we, we are essentially in the same problem as, in, as before, the chocolate cookie problem or the other one, except that now the model is not defined only from one single variable, but one single parameter, but have, have many parameters. So here's the setting. Um, I have a problem, which is um, a configuration of my problem. It's a set of P variables. And I observe, for instance, one configuration, sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma p. They might be real numbers. <coughs> they might be also uh, discrete numbers. I'll come back to that later on. So let's assume they are real numbers. So one observation, let's say one sample, is just a, a, a p-dimensional vector. And I'm assuming that I will sample my model n times, and I'm assuming the samples are independent, which is in most experimental cases is not true, but I mean, let's make this simple assumption. Um, and let's make, let's say, the simplest case of a model where you have actually um, this setting is, is a multidimensional uh, Gaussian distribution, multimodal Gaussian distribution. So, for instance, you, you have a um, multivariate Gaussian distribution, sorry. So, the density of the sigma vector um, given tau is going to be given by this formula here. So, you have a Gaussian form. For simplicity, I will assume that it is centered around zero. It doesn't change anything. And tau is the inverse of a covariance matrix that's called the precision matrix in, in, in statistics. In statistical physics, we would call it up to a minus sign decoupling matrix. It's the same thing. And then you have a normalization factor, which is the square root of the determinant of tau. Okay, so the question now is the following. Suppose I give you some observations, so I give you a list of n configuration, each one is a p-dimensional vector, and I'm asking you, uh, what is the matrix tau? So incidentally, you see, that's a, that's a problem which is very close to the uh, experimental motivation I, I've shown you before. You observe the configuration of your system, and from this list of observations, you would like to understand how the variables, how the components interact between each other. That's a useful problem. Of course, the assumption that the way they interact is a Gaussian distribution is, is very simplistic. But let's, let's first look at that, which is interesting. It's not trivial. So if I do um, my Bayesian inference, and I want to maximize over tau, then I have something which is called the maximum. So, so maybe I, a little bit of vocabulary I should have given in the slides I forgot to give. So if you take p of, sig of tau sigma, It's to, uh, I should write here, it's better, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry, I, I did not understand why there was a line, but now I understand. <laughs> so if you take the posterior distribution of a tau, given the observation, and you maximize this, so by maximization, you get some estimator, which depends on sigma, which is called the maximum a posteriori. So that's called the map estimator. And it will depend on your observation, obviously. Now, if you assume that the prior is uniform, so P of tau does not depend on tau, or you forget about it and you just look at the likelihood, which is how your data are generated from your model, and you do maximization, you get another estimator, which is called the uh, maximum likelihood estimator. ML or MLE of sigma. They coincide when the prior is uniform. Okay? It's just a question of vocabulary. So let me do a maximum likelihood estimation here of my precision matrix. So I take the probability here, or density or probability of the observation. I'm assuming they are um, all independent. So the probability of my observation is just a product over all the samples S 
of rho of sigma of s given tau. And I want to maximize this over tau. But I can maximize the function, maximize its log, it, the same thing. So what I want to maximize is the sum over all samples of the log of rho of sigma of s given tau. OK? And the maximum likelihood estimator will be the argument max of this thing here. <coughs> OK, so let's take the log of this expression, sum over s. So we have two terms. One is going to be the sum over s of, this, of, of the exponent here. And if I differentiate with respect to tau, in order to, to write the uh, maximization equation here, what I get is this term. If I differentiate with respect to the element ij of a precision matrix, I get this term here. So this is simply, this term here is simply the correlation between the variable i and the variable, variable j, where i and j run from 1 to p in the data. And the dot product here is just a, a matrix product over the sample s, the sample index s. Is it clear, or should I? I mean, it's a, it's a very simple calculation. You just take the log of this, sum over s. You see, you have a sum over s here, so maybe I if I want to be a little bit, maybe it's going a little bit too fast. So I have minus one half, sum over s, which is a sample here. And then let me put all the indices so that everything is clear. You have a sum over i and j, you have sigma i s tau i j, sigma j of s. You agree? That's one term in the, in the log likelihood, okay? which I can write as I just do a permutation between the sum, and then I have a tau ij, and here I have a sum of the s, sigma i s, sigma j s. And I'm, I'm saying that this thing is a correlation matrix c i j between variable i and j in the, in the data. OK, so if I differentiate with respect to tau ij, I will get this term here, correlation ji. And then I have also this term here, the square root of the determinant of tau. I take the log, so I have one half log of that tau, which I have to differentiate with respect to tau ij. And this is, gives me the inverse of tau, element ji. Everybody agrees with this formula? When you differentiate the log of a determinant of the matrix, you get the inverse of the matrix. Okay? <clears throat> and at the maximum, of course, the gradient should vanish. So these two terms should be zero, the sum, sorry, of the two terms should be zero for all i and j. And what does that mean? That means that the inverse of the precision matrix should be equal to the correlation matrix. And actually, what we say is that it's something very obvious here. We just say that the inverse of the precision matrix, which is actually the covariance computed from the distribution, okay, should match the covariance computed from the data. Okay, so that, that makes a lot of sense. So you have to adjust your model in such a way that if you compute from the distribution, from your model, the covariance matrix, it matches exactly the one you compute from your data. That's the best thing you can do. So it's a very simple thing. Okay, yes? Yes, tau is symmetric, yes. Yes? <laughs> yes, oh, sorry, the transpose is in this uh, S space here. Okay, so this is a symmetric matrix in the, uh, uh, in the IJ space, right? Sorry. Yeah, maybe the notations are not very good, but I hope that with the blackboard you, you can see what I mean. OK. Yes? Exactly. And you say that the one from the model should match the one from the data. Exactly. That's a classical thing which people call moment matching. In, in statistics conference. You match moments of a distribution, the model one with the data one. Okay, so I didn't plan to 
do the calculation on the blackboard, but if you are interested and can give you handwritten notes, I mean, about this following fact, you can show that this function here, this look like you here, is actually a convex function of the matrix tau. It's not, it's not difficult to show. If you are interested, I can give you notes because I didn't want to do that on the blackboard. So if I um, do something a little bit, of course, I mean, the space here of the horizontal axis is a space of matrices, so it's not a 1D space, it's more complicated than that, but let's say L is the convex function of this. So there is a single maximum, which is exactly what we would like to estimate, and that's the inverse of, a cor of the correlation uh, covariance matrix on the data. Okay, so the, the fact that it's a convex function, okay, so it's convex for many problems where you do uh, network inference. If you see all the nodes in the network, if there are some nodes that you don't see, because you don't have experimental access, and this is always true in many, in many experiments. So, you know, I showed you, for instance, the retina, and people put electrodes, but the retina is like that. Okay, so it's a bit smaller than that, but let's say it's like that, and you put electrodes here, so you see only a small patch of it. So when you have hidden nodes, then it's not convex anymore. So here I'm assuming I see everything. I'm sampling all the variables in my, in my system. So generally it's not convex. In some cases it is, and that's a nice case. Yes, it wouldn't be convex anymore. It would not necessarily be convex. Yes, it's just one particular case where I know Okay, so I will show you tomorrow, I mean, not tomorrow, but after tomorrow, another case where with restrictive machine, when we have also some moment matching condition. So it's enough to do that, but you are not guaranteed that the log likelihood is a convex function. So there might be, you know, if you plot the log likelihood, there might be other, other uh, points. Yes, that's, that is very nice once you, once you have it. Yes, I agree. But it's very uh, non-generic. I mean, in many cases, it's not. Um, so if you're interested, I can show you how to, this can be shown. Okay. So actually, convexity by convex, I mean, the Hessian is, is uh, non-negative. That doesn't mean they, they, they cannot be zero modes. They can be zero eigenvalues. So in that case, that means that the maximum will be essentially at infinity. So, if this is something you don't like for particular application, then that can be, you can prevent from the maximum from being at infinity by adding some, uh, some, some prior information. So you see, for instance, that the elements tau ij, for instance, should not be too large. So for instance, you have a prior p of tau, which is going to be proportional to something like that, You know, that prevents the tau ij to, to go to infinity, and then, but you have to choose the, the strength of the penalty here, uh, gamma, in, in an appropriate way. I'll come back to that later. But that's just one side remark, that the, the fact that you have convexity doesn't mean that your maximum will find it. You have to be a little bit careful. <clears throat> okay, but then there is a much bigger problem, which is this one. So what I have to do, if I believe in this formula, is to take the covariance matrix, invert it, and then I, I'm done. Okay? But then here is a problem. What we have, we have a, system, a problem with p variables, and we have n observation. And we compute the um, empirical covariance matrix with this formula. Okay, so this is a sum running from 1 to n, which is the number of observations I have. And this matrix is actually, it's a p by p matrix, right? Okay, so now if I take <clears throat> one element, for instance, the Cij, which is somewhere here, I take in this, so this is line number i and column number j, and I'm asking what is the accuracy I have on this element if I have an observation? Well, you could say if all the observations are independent from each other, you would expect that this thing here, what I observe, is going to be the true Cij, what I would get if I had an infinite number of observations, plus some noise, maybe Gaussianly distributed, 
over the square root of the number of observations. Typically, this is what you would expect. So that means that each element here will be equal to the correct element, which is exactly what you, the tau minus one, if you had an infinite number of observations, plus some plus or minus some noise of order one square root of n. And this is true in all elements, right? So all elements are, if, so if n is 10,000, you say, well, that's not too bad, okay? They are all almost true. But the problem is that this is all over the place. So each element is wrong, a little bit wrong, and there are many of them. So the question is, what will happen when you do the inversion? So there could be a total disaster, okay? Especially if you have an ill, Ill conditioned matrix. It's well known that a small error on the elements can create a big disaster in the inversion. So it's a big problem. So typically, and this is what I wrote here. So when I am safe, I am safe if n is going to be much larger than p. Then in that case, the, invert, the, the inverse of the matrix should be, should be OK. But if n is smaller or of the order of p, then it's going to be bad. Uh, and you can understand that, because if you write, for instance, the eigenvalue equation for this matrix, you see that you have a sum over p elements, um, which are all, uh, let's say, wrong up to 1 over square root of n uh, terms. So that will, be, that will give you errors of the order of square root of p over square root of n. So if n is much larger than p, it's going to be OK. If they are of the same order of magnitude, it's not going to be OK. So we expect that, you know, in this plane I was mentioning here, then there might be something here, so n will be the number of the data here, p, b, p will be the complexity of the model, the size of the model, maybe when p is over the n, something is going on. So it's the first hint in the, in, in the direction of the existence of this line. Okay? Okay, so I, I want to show you now one particular, which is, a, let's say, one application of this, or let's say one subcase of this, where actually you can see exactly this phase transition taking place. Okay, so um, let me consider the first case, which is the trivial case. Suppose that my precision matrix tau is the identity matrix. So if I put, sorry, if I put the identity matrix here, then the variables do not interact together. Okay, so it's a trivial case where I have no interaction at all. So they are all independent. So it's a very simple case, but it's an interesting case. So if tau is the identity matrix, then the correlation matrix, the inverse of tau, not the one from the data, the one I would get from the distribution is simply the inverse of the identity, so it's the identity. So another way to say that is that if I look at my data, so, sorry, this is not D, this is sigma here. So I have a problem which is a p-dimensional problem. So if I look at different axes, sigma 3, sigma 2, sigma 1, and so on, then if I generate now uh, P points, uh, N points, sorry, in this space, then they will basically constitute or make a cloud. And uh, the size of this cloud, or let's say the standard deviation, is related to the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix, and all eigenvalues are one. So I get an isotropic cloud of, of, um, of radius one. Okay? This is what I get. So this is what I expect if there is nothing to be understood. Okay, if you have no interaction, no, a trivial situation, I will get a cloud of points, and which is isotropic in, in all directions. Of course, you can have cases a little bit more complicated where uh, instead of having all ones, you have different numbers here because the, covari the variances are not equal, so it would be a little bit more elongated, but anyway, it would be always around the axis. So let me uh, rescale all the variances so that they are all equal to one. OK, so now let me look at the minimal non-trivial case where I want to have some interactions between the variables. So I will choose one specific direction in this p-dimensional space, which I call E. So E is a normalized vector, p-dimensional vector. And then I will choose for the, for the precision matrix, the identity, which is the trivial case, minus S over 1 plus S times the projector on E. So S is a positive number. Could be a negative number, so I will come back to that later on. But let's, let's assume it's a positive number. So why do I choose this form here? Because if I compute the inverse and get the correlation matrix from the model, I, I get the identity plus S times the projector over E. So now if I uh, generate data from this distribution, where tau has this form here, 
and I plot the data, I have a cloud of point, as, as before, but now the cloud of point is more interesting. It's elongated along the E direction, and the uh, eigenvalue of, of C of a, along this direction is, well, you can read it from here, it's 1 plus S. That means the standard deviation is going to be square root of 1 plus S here. Well, in the other direction, it's always 1. So it, Okay, so we see that if we look at the data and at the points, uh, we will see that one direction is special and interesting because the, the cloud of point is more elongated along this direction. So finding directions where you have larger elongation is exactly the, the, basis, the, the basic principle of principal component analysis. So I don't know if you are familiar with principal component analysis. Maybe some of you, maybe not all of you. Okay, so principal component analysis is one of the, let's say, simplest statistical approach, unsupervised statistical approach, to do dimensional reduction. So here's the problem, you see? You have p-dimensional data. p can be, I don't know, 10,000, can be a huge number. You cannot visualize anything. You cannot understand anything. So if you want to go to low dimension where it's easier to understand what is going on, you have to find the, the right direction, the interesting, important direction. So here, E. There is something going on along E. There is nothing going on along the other direction. So principal component analysis is this idea, exactly. Um, if you are in a very high dimensional space, you will have to look at the direction where you have more variance than along the other directions. And <coughs> you can retain a certain number of them, depending on how, the number should depend on how big is the variance along this particular direction, and then do projections in this low dimensional space. And maybe you will see some structure in the data which is very hard to see in this high dimensional space. So just to give you a practical example, well, I mean practical, Let's say a concrete example. I'm not sure it's very interesting, but I can show you. That's something we have done just for fun. So if you take, for instance, this data set, which is called the MNIST data set. It's a well-known data set in, in machine learning, which is made of uh, uh, handwritten digits. So it was collected by the uh, US Postal Service at the time where people still, uh, are still, I mean, uh, able to write letters, which is not the case now. I mean, nobody writes letters anymore, but uh, at that time, people used to do that. So what you get is um, 60,100 60, handwritten digits, so digits between 0 and 9. And there are, you see just a bunch of them here. So they're all written here on a square, which is a 28 by 28 pixel square. So the dimension, and just to make life simpler, we will assume that the pixels are black and white. So in the original data set, they are gray, but let's assume they're black and white. So that means that you have this 28 by 28 grid. And each one of them <coughs> carries, each pixel carries a, a white or black uh, um, dot. Uh, so the dimension here, P, of the data will be 28 square, which is 784. So that's the original dimension of your problem, right? And you have 60,000 points in that, in this space. Okay, and obviously, this is a data set. You, that people use, uh, consider, in order to do classification. You'd like a machine which is able to recognize a zero from a one or from a two or whatever. So let's try to see whether PCA, principal component analysis, could do that for, for free, essentially. Okay, so if you look, so what you can do is you can take your 60,000 digits. So this is going to be S. S is uh, 60,000 here. Okay, and you can compute this covariance matrix after uh, computing the average value, obviously. You have to subtract the product with the average value. Because the variables are not centered. And then let's look, look at the top components. So the components will be vectors in this uh, 784-dimensional space, and you can also show them on the same, on the same format as this, so a 28 by 28 grid. But now on each pixel, you get a real number. So you see the real numbers, and I think that, yes, the red color means negative, and the uh, blue color means positive values for these uh, eigenvectors. So they are ordered from the top eigenvector on the left to, you know, you go to bottom eigenvectors, but you see only five of them, the top ones. So you see these top eigenvectors, they look like, actually the first one looks like a digit, like a zero, seems so, uh, not so bad. The other one, they might, might be a little bit uh, different parts or mixed parts of, small di of other digits. So if I do dimen dimensional reduction blindly using the two top eigenvectors, this is what I get. So each point now is 
defined by its, so it's a digit, one of the 60,000 digit, and you compute its projection along the top eigenvector and the second top eigenvector. So you get two coordinates. Up here you see the points corresponding only to the zeros and the ones in the database. And you see that essentially you get a nice clustering of the two subsets. And what matters is the first direction. This is not very surprising because we have seen that the first eigenvector is, is very close to zero. So if you, get, if you have a zero, you get nice negative uh, values. If you have something which is not a zero, you get positive values. Or you get... So it's not a perfect separation, but it's, it's good. So you see, PCA, principal component analysis, is, very, is used in many, many applications to get, to, to get some kind of structure uh, from data, from complex data. So it's very important to understand the eigenvectors. Okay, but then here's the question. What we have is we have a model. So in our model, I'm assuming that there is a nice direction E which has some meaning. Then I generate data from this model, and I'm asking, am I able to find back E from the correlation matrix of the data? This is not obvious. If I don't have enough data, and we, we had an argument that if P uh, is much larger than N, that might not be the case, actually, uh, I won't be able to find E. So, so here's uh, the question. Sorry. I generate um, data here, and I would like to infer E from the data. <coughs> So maybe I can place here. Okay, so um, maybe I should. So remember, so tau was the identity matrix minus s over 1 plus s, e, e. So by the way, the fact that s is positive means that <clears throat> the width here is larger than 1. If s was negative, it would be smaller than 1, which is still an interesting formation. Okay? This is not what PCA does. Usually PCA looks at the large variances, but small ones, large, smaller than what you would expect if they were independent would be interesting too. Okay. So I will look at my data, and I will assume that they are generated by some Gaussian multivariate distribution here, and with a matrix tau which has this particular shape, but E is unknown. And what I would like to find is E from the data. So I want to find a direction. OK, so I write down the likelihood here, which is the one we had before. Now I inject the expression for tau, which is here. And you see that you have, if I look at what depends on E only, which is the unknown parameter, but depends on E, this is exactly this term here. Okay? The square root of the determinant of tau depends on S, it does not depend on E. I'm assuming I, I want to, dip, to, to, to infer E, the, the direction. So uh, the likelihood will be a function of E here, which is the sum over IJ, EI, EJ, times this covariance matrix here from the data. And there is a positive factor in front of that. So if I want to do maximum likelihood estimation, that means I should maximize this over E. And you see, if E is a normalized vector, that means I should get the top eigenvector of this movie. So we see that we have a maximum likelihood setting, which is exactly equivalent to principal component analysis. You take the covariance matrix, and you want to maximize this thing here. Take the top eigenvector. So now, let me, let me try to do a consistency framework, where I generate data from this multivariate Gaussian distribution with this particular precision matrix, right? Where I have, for instance, E star. So I generate the data. So this matrix is a, so it's a p-dimensional, p-dimensional problem. And I have n samples. Now I have a correlation matrix, Cij, which is the one uh, here, sum over S, sigma Is, sigma Js. I take the top eigenmode, top eigenmode, which I call E, and now the question is whether E and E star are similar or not. Okay? 
And that should depend on the number of data and also on the size of the problem. <coughs> so am I able to find back from the data the real structure, underlying structure of the problem? Is it clear for the question? OK, so, uh, so why is it not so easy to, to find back this E star? Why, is e, why could E be different from E star? So let's have a little bit of intuition. Take again the case of no interaction at all. You have the identity matrix for tau. So for infinite sampling, or if I take the model, which is the same thing, I compute the covariance matrix, tau minus one, all the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix are equal to one. So the spectrum is just a delta here in one, lambda equal one. Now, if I have the empirical correlation matrix, which is computed from a finite number of samples n, as I said, you have a little bit of noise everywhere, so the eigenvalues won't be exactly all one, and they will be scattered around one. And the width here will depend on the number of samples. The more samples you have, the more uh, narrow it will be. OK, so this is the situation. So we'll make that a little bit more precise, uh, much more precise in the following. But now, suppose now I am starting from a model which is interacting, and there is one eigenvalue of tau, which is different from one. And what, so that means the I, one eigenvalue of C, which is different from one, which is one plus S, is here. So you see, the question is whether this, very intuitively, whether this bulk of noisy eigenvalue you would expect without interaction is going to be close or not from this signal eigenvalue. If they are far away, it's going to be safe. And in principle, you should be able to infer E star. If they are more or less at the same position, then it's going to be bad. OK? So this is the basic intuition. OK, so what we want to understand is what is the spectrum of this thing here. So I don't know if you are familiar with random matrix theory. Maybe some of you are. So I won't do the calculation because it's not possible to do it in uh, five minutes. I have, uh, again, I have handwritten notes, or I can give you references to some papers if you're interested so that you can follow the derivation. I just want to give the results and try to make you understand the results here. Um, so just to state again, we start from tau equal to identity, which means we have p independent Gaussian random variables, which means zero and variance one. They are all independent, no interaction at all. We compute this matrix here. Due to the finite number of samples, this correlation matrix won't be the identity. It's something more complicated. It's a random matrix. And we want to understand its spectrum. OK. So here are the results, which were obtained by Marchenko and Pasteur um, in the 60s. And in fact, um, I'm just giving you the results. Again, if you are interested in the derivation, just let me know. OK, so um, in the high dimensional limit where both p and n go to infinity, so that means the size of a problem and the number of samples go to infinity at a fixed ratio, then the spectrum is not going to be um, a random. Um, so I have a problem with it. It's not a random variable anymore, OK? It's a deterministic object. So that means with high probability, probability going to one, you get always the same results for any kind of realization of the data. So the crucial parameter is R, which is P over N. So this is the number of variables divided by N. So if R is going to zero, that means that you have a large number of samples compared to the size of the problem, and it's a very uh, good situation. If R is big, that means you are under something. So it's going to be very hard to do anything. So uh, what Marshenko and Pasto found is that the distribution of eigenvalues is given <coughs> by this. So I'm assuming first that R is smaller than one. So that means that you have more samples than you have data. I mean, uh, than you have uh, variables. More samples than variables. So the spectrum is given by this equation here, where lambda plus and lambda minus are the extremity of the supports, and are given by this expression, one plus square root of R squared and one minus square root of R squared. So I will show you the, the, the picture in the next slide. But essentially, you have a support. So this is lambda. This is the uh, spectrum, rho of lambda. And it runs from, min from lambda minus to lambda plus, which are both function of R. And outside this 
support, the spectrum is zero, no eigenvalue, with high probability. And in between, you get something. Okay? Um, so, um, let me show you a curve. So, let's look at the <coughs> left side. So, here you see the spectrum obtained from this formula for different values of R. So, R is going to be here, it's 0.01. So, for 0.01, you get this curve here. You see, for R equal to zero, you should go to the Dirac peak in lambda equal one. So, R equal to 0.01, that means you have 100 times more samples than the size of your problem. So, it's a very good situation. You get, this is close to a delta, right? It's a, a finite uh, uh, R approximation of a delta. If you increase R, 0.1, you see it becomes wider and wider, and more and more asymmetric around one. And you go to 0.8, you get this funny shape here. See this funny shape here. This is association with 0.4. So as you increase R, going to one by, by uh, smaller values, you get a distribution which is wider and wider, and more and more asymmetric. Uh, for R going to zero, but not exactly equal to zero, let's say for small R, what you get is a more and more symmetric thing, and the reason is that you, you are going to the uh, semicircle law, Wigner semicircle law, which you might be aware of in random matrix, which is a basic object in random. Uh, and why is it so? Is it, you know, we, we don't have a Gaussian matrix, because the elements of Cij here, they are not independent from each other. What are, what is independent are the different configurations and the different variables. But once you compute the Cij, Cij and Cjk are not independent. But in the limit of R going to zero, very, they are become more and more independent. So we are going back to a, a Gaussian random matrix from the random orthogonal ensemble. So it becomes a, a semicircle law. Okay. So this is what you get for R smaller than one. If R is larger than one, it's almost the same thing, except that now you have more variables and samples. And of course, since the rank of this matrix is bound in from above by the number of samples, that means you, you get a P by P matrix whose rank is at most N. So if P is larger than N, that means that P minus N eigenvalue should be equal to zero. So that means that you get a Dirac peak in lambda equals zero of a given height here, and the rest of the distribution is given by the same expression as before. But again, look for instance at the case uh, R equal eight, which is here, <coughs> or let's say R equal to four. You see the eigenvalues go from this value here in the spectrum and they go up to lambda equal nine. That means that when you have a large undersampling, the eigenvalue, you are very far away from the uh, identity matrix. Correlation matrix is very, very noisy. Okay, so now what happens to our inference problem? So again, now I'm assuming that I'm generating data not with independent variables, with, but with variables which are independent, except that they are correlated along one direction, E, E star. So you can come, so the results which was obtained, and this was obtained in different papers, first in statistical physics in 1996, to my knowledge, by uh, Vandenbroek and collaborators. Um, and then it was shown rigorously by uh, by Ben and Rose Pesci in 2005 in, in the math literature. <coughs> it's the following. So now we have two parameters. R is an important parameter. It's P over N. That's a level of noise in sampling, right? Small R means very good sampling. And then we have another parameter, which is now the model has some interaction along one direction, which is S. So S is the bias with respect to the identity. Okay, so S is, let's say, the strength of the interaction. Okay, so when P and N goes to infinity, there is a phase transition when R is equal to S squared. So what does it mean? That means the following thing. Uh, if we are in the weak noise region, so R is smaller than S squared, so that means you have a strong signal compared to the noise, then if I look at the spectrum of the covariance matrix computed from the data, it will have one continuous part, which is exactly the one computed by machine capacitor in the absence of any interaction given by these formulas plus one eigenvalue standing out here, and it's not exactly located at the, uh, what you could expect naively, which is one plus S, 
but it's a value which is close to it. Then give back, go back to the value. But the intuition I gave before that there would be some bulky, noisy region plus one plus s. Actually, this Igamalu interacts with the bulk, so it's a little bit shifted away from the bulk. But the intuition is basically true. That's a good region, because if we look at the eigenmore corresponding to this eigenvalue here, that's our estimate for the top, for E, that's our estimate for E star. And in fact, you can compute the dot product, I hope I have it. Yes, you can compute the dot product between the E star, the E true, and the E empirical, which is the top eigenmode of the correlation matrix. And here is an example for S equal to 0.2. The transition is S square R equal to S square, so that's 0.04. And if you are above this, there is no, the dot product is equal to zero. If you are below, the dot product is, is larger than zero. That means that if I have my true direction somewhere here in the p-dimensional space, if r is larger than s squared, the top eigenmode is totally uncorrelated with the true eigenmode. So they are essentially orthogonal. In large dimensional space, they are always orthogonal. And if you are below r equal to s squared, so you have enough data, they tend to align. And this one, as r decreases, goes along the true one. And you see the dot product goes to one, which is perfectly aligned case. OK, and if you are on the other side of the phase transitions, when the noise is too strong compared to the signal amplitude, then you get exactly the Marshenko uh, uh, pass to uh, spectrum. So it's exactly the same spectrum as what you get for pure noise. So there is no way you can find the, the specific interaction direction from the top eigen mode. The top eigen mode is here, and it's just random. It has nothing to do with the, uh, the true direction. So that's a case where you see there is a clear phase transition when P and N goes, go both to infinity. And the phase transition depends on the relative value of the noise compared to the strength of the signal. <coughs> so one thing I would like to mention is that if you don't have one eigenvalue standing out here from one, but suppose you have k of them. So you would have s1 for the top one, s2, s3, s4, sk. And then after sk plus 1, all the sk plus 1, sk plus 2 are all equal to 0. Okay, So you have the identity matrix, except for k eigenvalues, which are larger than 1. Then what you will get is a bunch of k phase transition, right after, one after the other. And each one will be correspond to a value of a noise parameter r, which is equal to s sub i squared. For, for i running from 1 to k. So you start by having almost no samples. You can't see anything. Then you have enough samples to see the first eigenmode. Then you add samples. Then you see the second one coming out from the bulk. So you get two eigenvalues here. And then you'll see three, four, and, and this one will shrink. OK? So you see more and more structure in the data by adding more and more, more, and more variables, more and more samples. Yes? No, no, I'm not saying that, I'm, uh, maybe I was not clear. I'm not saying that the S1, S2, uh, the, okay, so. So suppose you so you have a tor of you have a correlation matrix, it's the same thing, but maybe the eigenvalues are a bit simpler here. So suppose you have, the first one is 1 plus S1, second one is 1 plus S2, and you have 1 plus SK, and then you get 1 all the way. And I'm assuming that S1 is larger than S2, which is larger than S3, which is larger than SK, which is larger than 0, right? But there are different numbers. Maybe I misunderstood your question. Oh, but then in that case, you would get, you could have two of them. Then you would get some degeneracy, essentially. But they, will, they should statistically come out at the same value of R. And then you get a mixed up between the two eigenmodes. Yes. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, yes? Oh, it means that, so if you look at many, many papers, um, people do uh, principal component analysis, right? 
And what they do, they, they compute covariance matrices, and they uh, diagonalize, and they pick up the top eigenvectors, and they, then they, they do projections, okay? But when you do that, you implicitly assume, so I'm not sure this is known by everybody in the, in the field, but this, this should be because these results are now, you know, they were there like 20 years ago. I mean, uh, this paper by uh, Anand Book is 96. Then they implicitly assume that they are in this regime, right? So that means that when you do that, you cannot detect anything, <coughs> any signal S, which is smaller than the square root of R. That you cannot do. Okay? So that means that um, many directions of interest, where, I mean, you see groups of variables which um, are, are correlated and evolve in a correlated way, dynamically, for instance, then you cannot see that if you don't have any data. So there should be some word of, of, of caution. Each time you do that, I mean, of course, people have to do experiments. They, can do what they, they, they cannot do more than what they have, okay? So they, they have to do this with their data. But that means that should be cautious that they might miss a lot of things because they don't have enough data. And this gives a precise bound on what they can miss. Yes, but, but, but you know R, okay? So you can say that you're sure you won't be able to find things S which are uh, bigger than the square root of R, right? Uh, smaller than the square root of R, sorry. <coughs> yes. Okay, so it's important, it's a word of caution about the use of PCA. PCA can, it's not a magic bullet, right? It, it works, it's, it's nice, but uh, it cannot detect a uh, signal when there is too much sampling noise. Okay, so, uh, so I, I have maybe 10 minutes. Yeah, so, here, yeah. yeah, so let me, I would like to finish with two things. So one is, uh, what can you do when, um, Actually, you are in this situation. So it's, it's a bad, uh, sorry, you are in this situation. That's a bad situation, right? It's a situation where the top eigen mode has nothing to do with what it should be, with the true one. So are we, then are we done? And there is nothing which can be done. So don't forget that everything which I've shown here was done with maximum likelihood estimator. So I'm not use any prior information. So maybe if we know something about the true answer, the true outcome, then maybe that could help, and we could actually beat this threshold. So I just want to give you a few examples of that, very briefly, that you have in mind. Actually, prior information helps in some cases, but not that much. Okay, so, um, so again, this is base formula. We, so far, we have used this. Now I would like to add some prior here. So what kind of prior can we add? Well, it depends very much on the structure of the model. So I want to show you something about with the prior of this particular expression, uh, which is a case where I know something about the components of the eigenvector. So we'll assume that I can write, as in a statistical physics, uh, some prior over the components, which is a factorized prior. So there is some potential, which is a prior potential, which I know, which means that the prior probability of a vector is, giving, is given by this, up to some uh, normalization factor, okay? So let me give you some examples. So one prior you can think of is that you know, for instance, that all the components of your eigenvector should be positive. It could be, right? For some reason, you know that. It's a, it's a structural constraint on the eigenvector. So what does that mean? That the potential here is going to be zero for, for positive E and it's going to be infinite for negative E. So a hard wall in, in E equal to zero. Um, then, of course, if you think about that, you say, well, but that's a trivial problem, right? Because if I know that all the components should be positive, let me take the vector 1 over square root of, of P, 1 over square root of P, 1 over P1, you know, a, la a line in only one, one, one direction, which is normalized. And then since I'm looking for a vector which, is, uh, which has all these components positive, the dot product of the unknown vector with this guess vector is going to be positive. So I always find something which is almost a line along it. It's not orthogonal. Well, that's almost true. This is true if my uh, eigenvector I want to find, the, the E star, has all these components different from zero, right? And they are all positive. But there might be some cases where it's very sparse, and just a few components, let's say a finite number of them, are different from zero. Maybe the E star I want to find is uh, 1 over square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2, and then all zeros. 
if I do the dot product with one of the square root of p everywhere with that, you see this vanishes when p goes to infinity. So what I found at the end of the game is something which is orthogonal to the true inventor. So that doesn't work. So it was shown that with, by Montanang and Richard a few years ago that if you use this prior here and you know that the true eigenvector is really has all these components positive, then you get also a phase transition as here. But now the noise level that you should have, the maximal one, is not S squared, but it's twice bigger, 2S squared. That means that you are sure in the large P-large N limit, with high probability, that you will find a vector which is aligned along the true direction with, if you use this prior, with a number of samples which is only half of what you would need if you don't use this prior. It's not a huge gain, but it's a factor two on the number of samples. That's something, right? <coughs> the prior is that you, you should now, what you should do, you know, Remember what we did with maximum likelihood estimator? <coughs> maximum likelihood estimator, what we did is we maximized something which was, let's say, let me take the log of this. We maximized the sum of it, i and j, e i, c i j, e j. We did that, right? And if you maximize this, that, that corresponds to finding the top eigenvector. Now what you can do, you can maximize this under the constraint that all the EI should be positive. Well, I mean, I, I may assume that I may know that actually the true eigenmode has this constraint. But I, I, I need to know something about the problem, otherwise it doesn't make any, any sense, right? But in some cases, it can be true. It depends on the structure of your problem, right? Well. Yeah, so it's an example. So it's a proof of principle that in some cases, if you know the, if you have some prior information, then that will decrease the number of samples you need in order to find the direction. So another prior which is uh, maybe more interesting, I agree with, this, with you, but this one is very peculiar, is prior where, for instance, you know that many components of E are equal to zero. So now you have a, a potential uh, which looks like this one which is a potential which penalizes all components which are different from zero. And the higher the components, the more penalized it is. Okay? So if a component is equal to zero, you don't pay anything, otherwise the potential grows. Uh, you may think of other priors and so on. Uh, that's one we considered. That's a, a prior which actually gives extra weight for large components. You, assume, you don't care about the fact that there are many zeros, but you would like some of the components to be large of the order one when p goes to infinity. Okay. Um, so just as, a, as an example, let me, I don't want to, to show any, uh, any um, uh, calculation, but just, in fact, with this last prior, and in fact, I will show you on Thursday why this prior is interesting, you see again that you can beat this threshold, but you have to be very cautious. The prior can help, but it's very dangerous. So let me just illustrate that. So here is R, which is the ratio N over P. That's the level of noise. Okay, so here you have, so suppose S is 0.5 is fixed, that's the strength of a signal. So R equal to S squared is here. So here you are in a phase where you can infer the top eigen mode, no problem. And here you are in a phase where you cannot. Now let me add a prior. So I know, for instance, that my eigenvector has some large components of the order one when P goes to infinity. And what is going on when I increase, and here is the strength of a prior, the strength of a potential. So if there is no prior, then, for instance, for i equal 1, I'm here and I cannot infer anything. If I increase the prior, then I will reach some critical value here where I can infer something, and I will infer an eigenvector which is actually aligned along the true direction. That's very good. But then if I cross this second line here, the, prior, the strength of the prior becomes too big, and it will find large eigen, I, I components which have nothing to do with the real ones. So it's... I, I'm not showing any calculation here. If you are interested, I can give you. A, but I think it's important to understand that the prior may help. That's definitely true. But if you put too much emphasis on the prior, then it will just amplify the noise, and you will be 
stuck in some completely r random situation. So we have to be cautious with the use of priors. Okay, I'm not sure I have time for, uh, I had three more slides, so maybe I will stop here. Um, Stop here. Yeah, I, I will talk about that uh, when I do the applications on Thursday. <laughs> so we can take uh, maybe two or three questions if there are any. Yeah. Is there an intuitive way to understand why when you take a strong prior? your results become much worse. Like, you would expect that the more new you know about some, uh, the properties of the variable that you're estimating, you should get better and better estimates. No, no, but I mean, what, what, okay. So suppose I take a, a prior here. So the prior is this thing, right? You have exponential minus V0, and then there was something E, some of I, EI to a four. Uh, and that's a particular case. Okay, so what happens if I take V0 going to infinity? That means what I will do is that I will look of uh, an eigenvector, which is or of a vector which has one component equal to one, all the other zeros, and which maximizes this. So it will just pick up the component so that CII is, is, is bigger. You see? And if you do V0, which is not equal to infinity, but a bit smaller, it will do that. So if by, you know, and then you have this big matrix here, CI. So if you are unlucky and you have some fluctuations here, which makes maybe a couple of components, the, 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 so this is CIJ here, CJI. It turns out, of course, they are equal, but this one is big, so it will localize this vector on components i and j. So it should not be. So because you put too much thing, you amplify too much of noise. You have to find a trade-off between, you know, what you really want to maximize and what you know. I mean, it has to be. I, I will show. You, I, mean, I had another example in the three slides. I will show you on Thursday. The compromise is always the best situation is always between having no prior and have the infinite prior. It has to be somewhere in, in between. But the problem is that this region where you have to be might be very tiny. So it's, it's not an easy problem. I mean, uh, in general, you don't know enough to have a prior to define for the problem, right? So you want something that, that will sort of gently distinguish between different solutions that have uh, uh, sort of the, the same posterior probabilities, but, but not to influence too much, right? That, is that a good way of saying what a prior should or can do? Uh, well, I mean, but I mean, Yes, maybe. I mean, the point is that, I don't know. I mean, the point is that you, you must have some, some, some prior understanding of the problem. So, for instance, we, let's go back to a, a concrete example. You, I, I showed in the third example of proteins. I talked about that on Thursday. And you, you asked a question about the number of contacts. Okay. So, a, a reasonable assumption is that the number of long range contacts is not going to be too large. So, if you have a, a matrix n by n, you do not expect n squared contacts or n squared over 2, right? It probably be, it, it will probably be much closer to n than to n squared over 2, right? So then in that case, you would expect that the graph of interaction should be sparse. It makes sense, right? Then, so let's assume it's, it makes sense. The question now, how sparse should it be? Then you have to be very careful about the, the strength of the prior. So it ha the results have to be robust to the large range of, of strengths, right? So I fully agree with you. I mean, but, but the, let's say the structure of a prior should really come from the understanding of the problem. I, I think so. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see the rest of